from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. Last night was the culmination of the Democratic Convention, with presidential nominee Joe Biden accepting the speech in a, accepting the nomination in a speech and then going outside with his running mate with their spouses to a socially distanced rally that included even fireworks. Welcome now someone who is a longtime leader in the Democratic Party. She's Barbara Boxer. She served in the U.S. Senate for 24 years following a distinguished career in the House of Representatives. She is now co-chairwoman of Mercury Public Affairs. So Senator Boxer, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it was a successful convention by all accounts. I haven't heard anyone say otherwise. There was a lot mm -hmm. of positive feedback about Joe Biden. But let's be honest. Now you've had your say on the Democrat side. You're going to get Donald Trump and the Republicans coming after you. How do you defend against the Donald Trump who knows how to fight? Frankly, this is Donald Trump's America. So I don't think you need a special playbook. I think you just have to look out the window and think about what we've gone through these four years, the chaos the fact that we're no longer really a leader in the world. Our allies have abandoned us and tyrants love Trump. I mean, what is it? And then we get hit with a pandemic and the first thing Trump says is, oh, it'll disappear. We have 15 cases, it's going down to one. I'll never forget that day. And I know we're talking about business and I honestly think he thought that if he admitted what he'd just been told by people like Fauci, the stock market would go down. Well, you know, when you're the leader of the free world, you have to focus on the challenges. What did he do? He passed it off to the different governors and said, go forward, hardly giving them any money. And we are suffering. We are, su people are dying. People are scared. You know, this week I happened to be with my children and my grandchildren. Uh, my husband and I said, we can't stand it. Everybody got tested, everybody got tested because nobody wants to give it to anybody else. So fortunately, we're able to get together. But you know, uh, you talked about what I do with my life. One of the things I wanted to do was spend more time with my kids and grandkids when I left the Senate. And um, my golden years are turning into stolen years. And this is Donald Trump's fault. I'm sorry, not the not the virus, but I've never seen a president so afraid of something that he says, I'm not responsible. So that's what it's about. He can say whatever he wants. He could go after Joe and he will. He'll be vicious. They'll be vicious. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, how are we feeling about our country? And I don't think the feelings are good. You, all you have to look at is right track, wrong track. We've had, as a country, a very rough few months here, no question about it, because of this coronavirus and the economic consequences that came out of it. At the same time, we have a ways to go until November 3 and the election. Uh, mm -hmm. What does it do to the Democratic's position? What does it do to Joe Biden's position if, in fact, the numbers get better? And President Trump, by November 3rd, can say, look, at, we're coming back out of it. Oh, well, that's we're used to that. <laughs> There's no race that doesn't tighten at the end. But let me tell you what the issue is here. There's no sure thing, no sure thing whatsoever. Joe needs to get 270 electoral votes. We know the paths to get there. There's a couple of different paths, and we have to focus on that. And more than anything, more than anything, we have to uh, focus on voter turnout. That is critical, because when the pollsters ask who you're voting for, they, they really only ask the people who voted in the last presidential election. The others sort of don't count. So there has to be enthusiasm. And I think when he added Kamala to the ticket, it, that was a, such a healing move because, it, 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 as you know, we have seen tremendous um, protests going on in our streets with people of every ethnic background. And I think this ticket of Joe, who's older, Kamala, who is younger, male, female, different ethnicities, it's, it says something right in and of itself. So if that can be turned into voter enthusiasm, I think we're going to make it. If it isn't, if people say, oh, I don't think so, I'm not going to bother. And if Trump succeeds, which I don't think he will, in slowing down the post office, you know, this, this thing is a nightmare. Uh, you know, we, we've got issues before us. But I think we have to focus on getting out the vote and getting this postmaster general to stand down. 
so who should we be focused on in terms of voters uh, as we plot this out between now and November 3? I mean, before it was a handful of states, battleground states, supposedly Wisconsin, was Pennsylvania, Michigan. Who should we be focused on? Is it the suburbs? Well, first of all, let's start off with the states. Uh, you know, we have we, we know the states, and I'm not going to mention all of them, but in addition to the ones you mentioned, there's Florida, there's Arizona. We have to make sure we get Colorado, uh, Nevada. So we've got some states in the West, we've got states in the Midwest, and we've got Florida and even Georgia uh, in the South. So that's number one. Um, in terms of the suburbs, I, I just don't think there's a separate message. You know, I... Um, raised my family in the suburbs, uh, San Francisco suburbs. And it was very red country. When I got there, it turned purple and then it turned blue. But suburban moms, um, when they heard George Floyd call out for his mother, this grown man on the ground with all these uh, police officers and leaning on his neck, depriving him of oxygen, and he said, mama, mama, if you don't think that hit the women of the suburbs, not to say it didn't hit the men, but I'm very familiar with what women feel because we're moms, we're grandmas, we're aunts. And um, it, I think that, again, it all comes back to uh, the America we're living in. And do we have a good alternative in Joe? Yes, somebody tested, somebody compassionate. I never met anyone more empathetic. And by the way, I served with him for so many years. He's a great legislator. And when Barack Obama wanted to pass health care, Joe helped get the votes. And when we needed that stimulus bill, and business people remember that moment, how we needed a stimulus to bring our economy back, was falling out of bed. And who did it? Joe. So I think we have the alternative to a very dangerous president. Senator Boxer, no one could have watched that videotape with George Floyd and not have their heart go out to that man and to his family. No question yeah. about it. At the same time, in the wake of that, we had some fairly violent demonstrations in some places. And you can't watch the video, for example, in a place like Chicago and the rioting and the looting that went on without being concerned about it. We heard nothing about law and order out of this convention. Did the Democrats make a mistake? Because we surely are going to hear about it in, next week in the Republican convention. Well, it's obvious. Look, Joe wrote the crime bill. Joe has the creds. Kamala was a prosecutor. So you're not going up against a ticket, you know, that's going to say, oh, we don't need any police. And neither of them said defund the police. And I just do want to talk about your point about violence. That was a small percentage of the thousands and thousands of wonderful, good people who came out to say, we don't want to see this anymore. Black lives matter. And, you know, the people who were doing the violence, we know people who were anarchists on the right and the left. Let's face it. I've been to enough marches to know, you know, they try to wreck it for everybody because they don't care. They All they want is chaos. So I don't, you know, it was awful. And I was proud of our mayors and governors dealing with it. I thought when Trump sent in uh, homeland security people like his own militia, that was a black eye for him. Nobody liked that. And uh, people just said, what are they doing here? They didn't even have names on their shirts. You didn't know who they were. Okay. So this president, we've seen him for what he is. He okay. doesn't know what he's doing. He, he wants to be a dictator. His best friends are uh, dictators. Okay. It's, it's unreal. It's okay. unreal. Every day. And we have a yeah. very good ticket against it. Senator Boxer, I don't want to let you go without talking about the Senate for just a minute here, because okay, after sure. all, you served there for 24 years. A year or two ago, I'm not sure many people were even talking about the Democrats taking it. What are the prospects now, and what will make the difference? Okay. Um, I am not a great predictor, but what I would say is, if there's a blue wave for president, if there is, um, I think we're going to take back uh, the United States Senate. We have great candidates on the Democratic side. We have several black candidates running uh, in South Carolina, in, uh, in Georgia, in Mississippi, in Louisiana. I'm working to help them. I call it my Meet the Moment project because we need diversity in the Senate. When I got to the Senate, there were only two women. Then we had six 
And everyone said, year of the woman. No, you've got to get more than six out of 100. And now we have about 26. But it's a slow grind. We, you know, African-Americans are 13% of the population. And we only have uh, three African-American senators. So I think we have a chance with the excitement of the presidential ticket, if people, you know, really know they're going to have to work hard to vote. This is going to be something. And I loved it when um, some of our speakers said, and I think it was Michelle Obama, who was fabulous, and she said, just get a plan, get a plan. You may have to bring your chair, your water. You may have to stay there. Right. We're going to vote. Right. This right. is a right. big election, yeah. big Big election indeed. Thank you so much, Senator Boxer. Great to have you with us. That's Barbara Boxer. She's former Democratic senator from California. Coming up here, we get the scorecard for the Democratic convention from our Bloomberg political contributor and former John McCain campaign manager. He is Rick Davis. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for First Word News, and for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. There are new signs that the coronavirus pandemic may be starting to slow down in the United States. The U.S. has recorded fewer than 50,000 new cases for six straight days, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says deaths should soon start to drop as states and universities do more to contain the pandemic. Total coronavirus cases in the U.S. are at more than five and a half million. That's according to data compiled by Johns Hopkins University. More than 174,000 Americans have died. The nation's postmaster general's on Capitol Hill defending his management of the U.S. Postal Service. Louis DeJoy is testifying before the Senate Homeland Security Committee. As we head into the election season, I want to assure this committee and the American public that the Postal Service is fully capable and committed to delivering the nation's election mail securely and on time. This sacred duty is my number one priority between now and Election Day. The U.S. Postal Service is at the center of a political clash between President Trump and congressional Democrats over voting and the integrity of the upcoming November election. It's also become entangled in the stalled negotiations over a new virus relief bill in Congress. The House Oversight Committee will question Mr. DeJoy on Monday. Vice President Pence appears to be publicly disagreeing with President Trump about the far-right political movement QAnon. Pence told CNN he dismisses conspiracy theories. Earlier this week, the president said of QAnon supporters, quote, I heard that these are people that love our country. QAnon believers claim that the world is run by a group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who are plotting against the president. Turkish President Recep Erdogan says his nation has discovered large natural gas reserves off the Black Sea coast. Earlier this week, he promised to deliver good news that would usher in a new era for the energy-dependent country. President Erdogan said today he hopes to start extracting and using the reserves by 2023. Turkey is dependent on Iran, Iraq, and Russia for its energy. Last year, energy imports cost Turkey $41 billion. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. On this, the day after, political junkies are going through the Democratic Convention assessing how they did and also turning their attention to what comes next week when the Republicans get their turn. Here throughout our coverage has been Bloomberg political contributor Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital. So, Rick, thank you so much for being with us once again. Let me just use the baseball analogy, runs, hits, errors. How do you score the Democratic Convention? Well, I think on the runs basis, uh, you know, starting from the top, working down, uh, I think that the fact that uh, uh, Jill and Joe Biden were such a hit in their speeches, I mean, they both exceeded expectations, they both landed strong punches on the current president, and I think they all, both of them individually, made their case for why the Bidens would be a breath of fresh air in the White House. Uh, so, so kudos to them for that. 
I think there were other uh, hits. I mean, uh, roll call was one of the uh, surprise items that came out of this that has gone viral. So the, the, it has led to sort of some upside to the viral nature of the convention. And I think the unity of this convention, nobody expected the progressive lefts to toe the line and show the level of support they did. But even in video where they had the former candidates that opposed Joe Biden uh, in some of the video shots uh, when they were together, they actually looked like they liked each other and were enjoying themselves and actually liked Joe Biden. So, so how so about the errors? Likeability is just, a big factor in all this. No question. What about errors? Did you see any? Yeah, I think overall the viral nature of conventions was horrible, right? I mean, there was a lot of spits and starts. I mean, when, when Bernie Sanders was ready to give his speech, which was an important talk, uh, there was a lot of issues with starting on time, and, and, and the backdrops and, and some of the visuals were really uh, hard to get your head around. And the real question is, will anybody remember this convention two weeks from now? Um, where were the big moments that people will remember in October and November before they go vote? I really scratched my head to come up with something that I think is really interesting. Okay, so let's put that question to the Republicans. What are you expecting next week? What are the big, going to be the big moments? Because it surely will be very different from what we saw this week. Well, if, if, if this week was a reintroduction of Joe Biden uh, in his own leadership skills, Next week will be all Trump all the time. They've already said that he's going to appear every single day of his convention, which isn't horribly unusual. Even the Biden uh, uh, convention had uh, cameos of him each day at various times of the convention. But this is really going to be all about Donald Trump. I think he sees this as a celebration of his presidency and his, his aura as an individual, which is actually bigger than his presidency. And, uh, and so it'll be much more... Uh, focused. Uh, I think that it will lack the deep bench that the Democrats showed. You know, multiple presidents appeared at the Democratic convention. Uh, th there will be no former presidents appearing at the Republican convention. Uh, and, uh, and, and the question is going to be sort of how does he handle some of these issues? Obviously, he's uh, hot on China right now and will focus on some of the, the, the leadership that he's given to uh, try to push China back. Uh, and uh, and I'm sure he'll do a victory lap on his recent successes in the Middle East on peace talks and uh, and uh, recognition between UAE and, and Israel. So there are upsides, and I suspect he'll focus on it. The real question is, has he handled COVID and the economy? Because that has not been a strong suit for him lately. And also, can he stay on script, which should, could make it better television? Well, I, 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 only if he stays on script will it be bad. Uh, I have no doubt that the uh, managers of this convention are staying up late at night worrying about no matter what they design, no matter what they put in that teleprompter, Donald Trump is going to take control of that convention every single day and make news, and not necessarily the news they were out to make. But it will make it something worth watching, no question. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to Bloomberg contributor Rick Davis. He will be with us once again for coverage of the Republican National Convention. That's starting Monday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Meanwhile, President Trump right now is speaking at Arlington, Virginia, at the Council for National Pol Policy. He says that China will own America if Joe Biden gets elected. He also says that some allies are trying to take advantage of the U.S. You can listen to this speech on LiveGo on the Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Nobody said more. After years of neglect by both parties, my administration understands that a strong nation must have strong borders. Uh, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now to check on the markets. And this, on this day after the Democratic Convention, we want to check on how the markets may be reacting, actually, to what we heard. Abigail Doolittle is here. And Abigail, one of the questions is taxation, because the Biden campaign and Joe Biden have made no secret of the fact they've got a lot of plans, it's going to cost a lot of money, and our taxes are going to go up. Are the markets reacting to that? Today, probably not so much, David, but from a broader brushstroke standpoint, and I would have to preface this by saying this is more of an art than a science. As you were mentioning, right now the Biden campaign is talking about taxes going up by uh, roughly uh, 3.5 uh, billion, uh, and that would really, uh, you know, obviously be a hit. And from a broad brushstroke 
standpoint, uh, it looks like it'll be more income tax for the wealthy, uh, taxing more inheritances. The capital gains tax will then be taxed as ordinary income, and then of course killing tax breaks. Now, if we dig into this a little bit more, the bulk of this will come. 800 billion uh, is breaking, broken down, and this is from the Biden campaign in that capital gains tax. Then 730 billion uh, from the corporate tax rate being raised to 28 uh, percent. Uh, another one that's receiving some attention, 310 billion from capital deductions uh, for the wealthy, and then 90 billion for uh, top individuals being taxed at that rate of 39.6 percent. As for how all of this could affect the markets, it sounds as though on first glance it could be negative. But something I'd like to point out, David, this year we have this monster rally out of the March lows, up more than 50 percent. Uh, you know, the markets over the last couple of years, a real roller coaster ride. So whoever wins the presidency, it looks like it could be an overheated market. So I think it's difficult to say, uh, you know, that uh, if Biden wins the presidency and these tax increases go into play, uh, you know, that it is going to definitely be a negative. And I think a lot of people like the certainty that Biden, uh, as a president, could perhaps offer for the economy um, and uh, yeah. the jobs picture in some ways. Indeed, but it is a lot of money. I mean, adding up to about $3.5 trillion, which, which, which could make a difference. At the same time, it could affect different sectors differently. Can you sort out which ones might be hurt? which ones might even conceivably be helped? Well, you know, one reason to think that it could actually, this could be an issue for the markets, the sectors that are most likely to be hit if uh, Joe Biden does win the presidency, this, this year's stay-at-home sectors, including communication services, which includes the like of Google and Facebook, discretionary, which is, of course, being buoyed by Amazon, technology and healthcare. So that is something to keep in mind. On the other hand, sectors that uh, will be less hit or even benefit, uh, materials are likely to see their earnings uh, hurt by only about 3.8 percent, whereas those other sectors I was just talking about could see, see earnings hits of up to 10 percent. And then real estate, David, this is so interesting. REITs, they, of course, traditionally, one reason to invest in them is because of tax advantages. Under uh, President Trump's uh, tax plan that was uh, passed a couple of years ago, that actually has diminished to some degree. So REITs may uh, come back into the focus in a positive way for investors. Okay, thank you so much. That's Abigail Doolittle reporting on the markets and how they might be affected by Joe Pres Biden presidency. Coming up here, U.S. relations with Iraq on the heels of a meeting at the White House between the Iraqi Prime Minister and President Trump. We'll be joined by Brigadier General retired Mark Kimmett to talk about what was talked about and what it might mean for United States relations. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for First Word News, and for that we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is getting pressure from moderate Democrats running in swing states. They want her to reopen stimulus talks with Republicans. The so-called Blue Dog Coalition sees tomorrow's House vote on Postal Service funding as an opportunity to revive the negotiations. The Attorney General William Barr says he would be, quote, vehemently opposed to any attempt to pardon former National Security Agency contractor Edward Snowden. Barr made the comments to the Associated Press after President Trump suggested he might consider it. Snowden was charged under the Espionage Act in 2013 with disclosing details of highly classified government surveillance programs. The European Union's chief Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier, says a deal with the U.K. seems unlikely. Talks broke up today after a week with little progress. Sticking points include EU access to British fishing waters and the so-called level playing field requirements aimed at preventing a distortion of competition. Lebanon is proposing a two-week partial lockdown and a nighttime curfew. Coronavirus cases increased sharply after an explosion in Beirut earlier this month killed 180 people and wounded more than 6,000. The blast overwhelmed the city's hospitals. Officials say the virus has also spread because of crowding at hospitals and funerals and as people search through the rubble. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. 
Thank you so much, Mark. <laughs> Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa al Hanami met yesterday at the White House with President Trump, and high on the agenda was the question of continued U.S. Pre troop presence in his country. Welcome now, retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, who also served as an Assistant Secretary of State as well as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. So, General Kimmett, thank you so much for being here. Give us a sense of where we are with Iraq. We're so distracted with politics sometimes in the United States, we lose track of the fact we've got something like 5,200 troops there. Where do we stand? Well, I think overall we're trying to reset the relationship with the new prime ministers so that it's more on a mutual basis and, candidly, a non-military basis. Nonetheless, I think both the president and the new prime minister recognize that there will be some need for those American troops at a lesser number for some period of time. We don't need fighting troops, but the Iraqis still need intelligence support, air support, uh, other logistics support. So I expect that we'll see those troops at a smaller number in there for some period of time. So President Trump has made no secret of the fact that he wants to draw down those troops, as he is in various places around the, the world. Are we on the same page as Iraq is at one point, or is there some tension? Do we want to pull more out than what Mr. Khatami would like in there? Yeah, isn't it interesting that we've actually found a country where they want to keep us in <laughs> and we want to pull out? I think we'll find a middle ground. Department of Defense has a clear plan with President Trump, and I think that... Uh, the return of ISIS would not be something that the president would want to see or, candidly, excessive Iranian influence. So I think we'll see those American troops, uh, again, at a lower posture for, for a period of time. So, so, Mark, bring us up to speed on Iraq generally, because the last time we were talking, there was a lot of there were riots, demonstrations, and then we had that incident with General Soleimani from Iran and the Iranian in influence. We now have a new prime minister. Is the country stabilized to some extent? The country is stabilized, as you say, to some extent, but they're dealing with a lot of problems, some beyond their own control. I mean, external problems such as COVID is hitting them hard, loyal, low, lower oil prices that are hitting them hard. And, of course, they feel like the meat in the sandwich between the United States and Iran. They have their own internal problems. As you mentioned, U.S. troops, many groups do want them to get out. The prime minister wants them to stay in. They also have this problem with militias seeming to have more authority than the, gov than the uh, government troops themselves. The economy is in pretty bad shape, and uh, the protests are still going on. So this prime minister has a lot on his plate, but candidly, uh, the sensing is he's doing a pretty good job at this point. Uh, go to another country sort of in the general neighborhood, if I can say that, and that's Turkey, because there's a big announcement today that, in fact, Turkey apparently has found oil and natural gas in the Black Sea. How could that affect the geopolitical relationship in that region? Well, on one hand, uh, as you know, Turkey has been saying bigger than five. They have been trying to convince the world that they are a player. It's not just the five members of the Security Council. Uh, this discovery in the Black Sea, to some extent, gives them a, a, a lot more uh, muscle for geopolitical relations. But let's be candid. Um, they're not going to be Qatar, which has become a player because of natural gas. This is only about six and a half years of supply. Uh, Israel has twice as much natural gas. Uh, so I think that this would give them a little more muscle in the region, but not as much, I think, as President Erdogan may suggest. At the same time, it's going to take some time to get that oil and gas out of the ground, under the sea. So does it have an immediate effect, or is this down the road somewhere? Well, I think it has an immediate rhetorical effect, but even he admits that Turkey will not be self-sufficient uh, for their natural gas needs until about 2021, 2022, at the earliest, and it probably will be longer than that. As everything over there, it's more complicated than that because there's also questions about natural gas in the eastern Mediterranean that you have multiple countries potentially claiming. Yeah, they, uh, there seems to be the argument about where the continental shelf ends inside the Mediterranean. It's far more uh, explosive in the eastern Mediterranean because they're confronting their long-term enemy, Greece. And when you confront Greece, you are, in effect, uh, confronting not only the EU, but candidly a fellow NATO member. So uh, while it may be good news in the Black Sea, we're no closer to resolving the situation in the Eastern Med than we were prior to this announcement. Okay. Really appreciate you being with us. That's retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. I'm delighted to say he's going to be staying with us for the second hour on Bloomberg Radio, where we'll talk in part about what a gen a President Obama 
President Biden might mean for the military. Coming up here, kindness in politics. We talk with Biden supporter Daniel Lubetsky, founder of the company that brings you the Kind Bar. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Daniel Lubetsky built his snack food company into a multi-billion dollar business built around the central message of kindness. That's a message that we heard a lot about during the Democratic Convention. So maybe, maybe it's no coincidence that Mr. Lubetsky is a supporter of Joe Biden. And we welcome him now. Welcome, Daniel. It's great to have you here. So give us a sense. Kindness sounds Thank good. You. Can't be against kindness, no question. Is there any, is forgive the expression, meat to that? I mean, what is the substance of kindness when it comes to politics? Um, I certainly don't like Partisan politics, it's uh, not a field that I enjoy, but I do think that there are people that inspire us to become the best that we can be and rule by uniting us as opposed to trying to divide us and sow fear. And in this case, it's very clear that Joe Biden is a decent human being that cares about America, that has sacrificed a lot and that cares about our country. I'm an independent. I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm a very proud independent. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, Joe Biden is going to be the man for the moment to unite our country and transcend all these differences and protect our democracy and the values that we've taken for granted but that are under threat. So, so Daniel, you have uh, gotten involved in some very important issues around the world. Immigration, you come originally from Mexico City, and certainly in the Middle East with Israel, Palestinian relations. Can you just simply be kind and still stand for something? Because if you really stand for something, at some point you got to push back, don't you? Well, you talked about immigration. I'm uh, very, very respectful of the armed forces, of the need to have secure borders. And I think you can do that with compassion and respect and thinking about how we're going to welcome the best people to make our country the strongest that it can be. I don't remember the specific stat, but it's like staggering the number of people that are the CEOs or founders of a Fortune 500 company who are immigrants or children of immigrants. I am an immigrant. My father was liberated by American soldiers, and uh, we will never forget uh, how America welcomed him and welcomed us. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to have created thousands of jobs for and, and be a proud American that contributes in many ways if I had not been welcomed. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I think there's a way to protect our borders and do it with kindness and respect. You know, a lot of people confuse kindness with weakness, but it takes enormous amount of strength to do the kind thing. You know, it's very different from being nice. You can be nice and just be polite, but to be kind, you need to be strong. You can be nice and not bully, but to be kind, you need to stand up to the bully. And, you know, kindness requires a protagonist's force of action, and it's what we need today. So, so, Daniel, you are a very successful entrepreneur and businessman. Give us a sense of how your business has done under Donald Trump and how it might fare under Joe Biden. Do you have any concern there? Our business, uh, I've been in business since I've finished law school, 26 years, and uh, I'm very blessed that after 10 years of making a lot of mistakes that were self-incurred, the last 16, 17 years, we've grown and we've been very proud to grow with both Republican and Democratic administrations and work really, really hard. Um, I'm very, very comfortable uh, that our business is not the issue that keeps me up at night. What keeps me up at night is reading an article about how in Russia they poisoned uh, a person that challenged Putin. I don't want to live in fear, you know, as the son of a Holocaust survivor, as a person that was raised in Mexico, I don't take rule of law for granted. I don't take uh, any of these things for granted. Nobody should be above the law. Everybody should really respect our constitutional norms and our constitutional laws and not take these things for granted. It's really, really important for us to defend these things. And I, th I think these elections allow a lot more than whether I'm going to sell more kind bars or less. It's about making sure that we're all working together to defend our constitution, to unite our country, to work together, uh, to build bridges and to build a better future for so many people that have been left behind. 
Daniel, I know that one of the things that you've worked hard on, thought a lot about, is the strife between the Israelis and the Palestinians over in that part of the world. At the same time, President Trump now has delivered, it would expect, uh, the, the normalization of relations between Israel on the one hand and the UAE on the others. That's the first time I think since Egypt normalized relations, the last time well, an Arab country too. Do you give President Trump some credit for that? He did something that had absolutely. not gotten done. Not since Egypt. There was a Jordan treaty since then, but uh, and then there was a hopeful effort between Israelis and Palestinians in, um, the, in Camp David and in, in the Rose Garden, but that doesn't hasn't really panned out. But yes, I absolutely give the Trump administration a lot of credit for uh, them achieving a resolution and a hopeful resolution between the UAE and Israel. It's, it's something that I'm very, very grateful for and, and respectful of. And, and will it actually inhibit the settlements? Certainly, it certainly seemed to put a freeze on the possibility of annexation. We, we, we will see how things, you know, everybody's providing a different story about what's the narrative, but I actually am very, very proud of the progress. I think President Trump had the courage to uh, put an embassy in the capital of Israel, which is Jerusalem. It was the only country in the world where other people thought they had to decide where the capital of their own nation should be. Every nation should be sovereign and able to decide where the capital is. And so I'm, I'm, there's a, a number of things where I respect what this administration has done on that front. I do believe that there are huge issues here in terms of defending democracy, defending rule of law, making sure that we uh, have in our White House someone that is a role model to all of us so that when, you know, you have a daughter, she doesn't need to feel that there's misogynism in the White House. So when you have children, they can know that um, if you build your life with respecting other people, with empathy, with kindness, with thinking about the United States before you think about yourself, that's how we're going to build a better country. Uh, Daniel, no one who loves this country cannot be really committed to the rule of law and to making sure that we're a law of government, of, of, of laws, a government of laws, not of men. At the same time, do you think that President Obama may have gone a little too far to say that one man, Donald Trump, might actually undo that, with something we've had for so very long here? Isn't that going a little far? Look, I... I my entire life is about trying to listen to each other and trying to respect other people and really try to see the other side. I have a very hard time thinking that this is not one of the most important consequential elections of our time. I think if our current president has behaved the way he has behaved the last four years, if he gets reelected, I'm terrified about what that can mean for the rule of law for things that we've taken for granted, like freedom, like equality, like respect. Um, I don't think this is a, a, a light matter. I think it's very serious and consequential. And I don't think you can overstate it. I mean, authoritarian, authoritarian leaders don't become control a democracy overnight. It takes time. But we as a nation have to make sure that politicians understand that they are responsible to represent us. They're here to serve us. We're not here to serve them. And it's really, really important that we have in the White House a public servant like, I was about to say President Biden, like uh, Vice President Biden said yes yesterday, right. Right. he's gonna look after everybody, regardless right. of who votes for them. The president is the only office that has to think of everybody and they right. have to transcend this partisan politics. Right. Joe Biden has shown the ability right throughout his history to be nonpartisan. I think it's really, really important that both progressives on the left and conservatives on the right find a way to find common ground to listen to each other and to unite, and Joe Biden is the person to do that. Okay, Daniel, really a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for your time. That's Daniel Lubetsky. He is founder and executive chairman of Kind Snacks. Coming up, presidential candidate Joe Biden sent a strong message of support for organized labor last night. We talked to one of the foremost leaders of organized labor. He is Richard Trumka, president of the AFL-CIO. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. As president, the first step I will take will be to get control of the virus that has ruined so many lives. Because I understand something this president hasn't from the beginning. We will never get our economy back on track. 
We will never get our kids safely back in schools. We'll never have our lives back until we deal with this virus. That was Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden speaking last night to the Democratic National Con Convention, vowing to take control of the virus as his first step in office. For more on the union perspective, we welcome now Richard Trumka, AFL CIO president. So, Richard, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so, uh, you, you and I have talked about this before. You agree with pre the, the presidential candidates, certainly, that this is number one priority. Is it sufficient, though? If he could really fix the virus, is that enough to get the jobs back that we need? No, but you can't get the jobs back until you do. And that's a big contrast between him and the president. Uh, the president never has understood, and I don't think ever will, that in, in order to fix the economy, you really do have to fix the pandemic because it's such a drag on everything. After you fix the pandemic, then you have to do all the things that are necessary. Start investing in infrastructure. Start bringing those jobs back. Start looking at the tax code and incenting people to build here and to make things here, and you'll start to grow the economy. Giving workers a chance to increase their wages Ages, David, because remember, our economy is 72 percent driven by consumer spending. So when workers have more money in their pocket, they can spend. That spending creates demand. That demand creates jobs. And so that's the virtuous cycle upward rather than the vicious cycle downward that we've been in for a while. So, Richard, we still have, I think it's 74 days left to go to November 3rd. we got to think about what's going on between now and then. We just got new jobless claims numbers in, which were higher, above a million. I think it was a million four or something like that. What do we need to do to get some of the jobs addressed right now before we wait for November 3rd? Well, first of all, people are hurting out there. Uh, and I really think it's horrible that Mitch McConnell took the Senate and went on a three-week vacation and left people you know, holding the bag. Uh, the $600 a week uh, unemployment extension exp expired. Uh, the hazard pay expired. A uh, number of things that would help workers expired. They need to pass the HEROES Act. The HEROES Act is of the size that will meet the problem that we have. Because the problem we have is you know, you know, enormous, just enormous. And so passing the HEROES Act will start that. It will give us a standard. Uh, health and safety standard to protect those workers that are still on the job, mandate that they have to have proper PPE that they're still fighting for. In some instances, we have to supply it for them because they can't get it elsewhere. It will help state and local governments. It will help the school system so we can actually open up the schools. It will do all of those things plus more uh, help with health care, uh, the people that are losing their health care. The HEROES Act really should be passed. And it's been on Mitch McConnell's desk for, I think, 95 days right now, and he's done nothing. So you've been steadfast in that position, Richard. Would you take half a HEROES Act or something less than half a HEROES Act? Because right now there's talk that maybe Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi is considering, let's take part of it now, come back for more later. And some moderate members of her caucus reportedly are asking for just that. Would that work for your members, understanding you want to come back later for more? Well, here's what it would do. Instead of having... 12 months of unemployment insurance and give us six. So would we go with that? Yes, we would go with that because we'd have six months of people not suffering. Right now, people are suffering. They're being evicted. They're having their utilities turned off uh, in, in high numbers uh, because they don't have the, the resources to do that. So we would, we would work on that. Nancy actually, I mean, Speaker Pelosi actually made that proposal that she would go, they were at three trillion, the Republicans were at one trillion, go to two trillion and then come to a deal. They said no. Uh, so that's in the short term, and the short term is terribly important for the reasons you identify. There are people really hurting out there, not being able to pay their bills. Let's go to the longer term now. Also in uh, uh, Vice President, now presidential candidate, Biden's remarks last night, he very specifically said he wanted on his administration, if it comes to pass, really to support organized labor. What does that mean in practice? Well, first of all, look, look in this economy right now, David, there, there are, there's inequality. But when we talk about inequality, most people think of just wages and wealth. But there's also inequality of opportunity. And both of those are driven by inequality of power. Corporations are too strong because the laws are antiquated. They were made in the 1940s. We're still living under those laws. So we have to rebalance that power. When you rebalance that power, work workers will get a chance to negotiate for a better share of what they produce. And instead of inequality growing, 
inequality will begin to shrink and the middle class will begin to prosper again. That's what he means. To do that, you have to pass the, the PRO Act. That would change the laws and give us a fair chance to have a voice on the job. You have to change the tax laws. President Trump's tax laws, there's a provision in it that actually encourages outsourcing. It rewards companies who build things offshore. We have to reverse that. We have to do a number of other things, uh, and he's committed to doing all of those things. A manufacturing priority. Because remember, when you lose manufacturing, you don't just lose the factory. Yeah. You, you lose all the R&D that goes with it. And that's been our strength. We've been able to yeah. develop products and get in front of right. everybody else. That goes bye-byes. We can bring that back, and he's committed to doing that. Richard, it's always such a great pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. That's Richard Trumka. He is the AFL-CIO president. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. And in our second hour, we're going to look at what the RNC and former HP CEO and presidential Carly Perea Arena thinks about what Joe Biden said. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.